And we might have different convictions on some things, but unless there's a clear command in Scripture, we need to give the freedom for disagreement. So let me give you seven things real quick that Paul has said in chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. He says, don't argue over these things. Think about unity. Focus on unity. Orient yourself toward unity. Number two, he's, he He calls us to ask this, am I persuaded, fully persuaded in my own mind in chapter 14, verses 1 through 5? In other words, when I'm looking at a decision to make with a non-essential issue, don't argue over it, pursue unity, but then also ask yourself, are you fully persuaded about this? Number three, am I doing it unto the Lord in chapter 14, verses 6 through 9? Number four, will it stand before the judgment of Christ in chapter 14, verses 10 to 12? Number five, am I offending or causing a brother to stumble in verses 13 to 21? Number six, can I honestly say that I am doing it in faith? Verses 22 to 23. And this morning what we'll see is the last one is, can I honestly say I'm doing this to please myself or to please others? Paul is going to argue that in this, as in the rest of them, we're to follow Christ. When you consider Jesus and what he was willing to do to save you, How can setting something aside for unity be such a big deal? That's where Paul's going. Let me ask this. Do churches have the right to establish standards of minimum conduct? Let me think about that for a second. I don't know. We got a lot of different backgrounds in here, but sometimes some people maybe came from a fundamentalist Baptist background. And and in, in fundies take the fun out of fun. Like, right? Like, they're so strict about everything that they make all sorts of rules, and and you can't possibly live up to all of them. So what you end up doing is you end up just putting on a front and pretending, but then living a different way outside of that, right? So we should probably ask that. Does the church have a right to set up minimum standards of conduct? I would say yes, but they can't go beyond what the Bible teaches. That's where the rub is. That's where the rub is. When we go beyond what the Bible um, commands, when we don't allow what the Bible allows, when we forbid what the Bible doesn't forbid, we end up getting into some very dangerous territory. So then the question becomes, like, what if it's not directly addressed? Right? We got all sorts of things like that. There are, there are a lot of things. The Bible is fully sufficient, fully authoritative. It has everything that's necessary for life and practice, right? Yet there are a lot of things that the Bible doesn't directly address. How should you dress when you come to church? Should you have two church services or one church service? Should you have a Sunday night service? Should you have a Wednesday service? Should you meet in a building or should you meet outside? Should you meet in a home or should you meet in a, in a building that you purchase? There's a lot of things that the Bible doesn't address. And if it's not directly addressed, then we have to make decisions based on principles in the Bible and conscience. We have to ask ourselves, am I doing it unto the Lord? Am I fully persuaded? Will it stand before the judgment? Am I offending or causing a brother to stumble? Can I honestly say I'm doing it by faith? And am I doing it to please myself or to please others? He's showing us what a healthy church looks like. You know, you, so Carly and, and the girls aren't here today because Finley woke up sick. Right? You know those indicators when your kids are sick? Like, you know that. You look at them and they just don't look right. Or maybe they're slower than normal, moving around the house. Or, or maybe they have like a tired look on their face. Or maybe their skin is flushed. Like we can look at things and see when it's healthy or not healthy. The well, same thing is true of the church. When you look at the church, you can tell whether it's healthy or whether it's not healthy. 
A healthy church is marked by the mature helping the immature, by the strong helping the weak. And maturity is identified by love. And we can set up all sorts of constructs, all sorts of ideas about what maturity is and is not, right? Putting the fun back in fundamental. If you don't do this, 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 you're not mature. We can measure maturity based on knowledge. We can look and say, well, that person has a lot of Bible verses memorized. They must be mature. We can look at somebody and say, well, they do devotions twice a day. They must be mature. We can look at somebody and say, they must be in three, they're in three Bible studies. They must be mature. We can look at somebody, they show up to, to church on time. They must be mature. Oh, they show up to church early. Man, they're really mature. They come every time the doors are open. They must be mature. Do you know every one of those can be a marker that we can point back to the Gospels and see where Christ identified Pharisees based on those types of things? Very dangerous. Maturity in Scripture is marked by love. I'll say that again. Maturity in Scripture is marked by love. And those habits, though they can be good things, may or may not indicate love, right? I mean, you can read the Bible and do devotions twice a day and not love God in the process. You can do devotions twice a day and do it because that's what you're supposed to do or because your friends do it and you want to keep up with them. The read through the Bible in a year plan can be something that's done out of a love for God and desire to saturate your life with the whole counsel of his word. And it can be a thing because you had somebody that you respected or that you looked up to that said you should do this and you just do it. Paul is taking and, and moving the marker of maturity throughout this whole chapter and a half. It, he brings it back to motivations, to longings, to desires. So look in Ephesians chapter uh, 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, he says this. This, this, is, the, this is like one of those big texts for us here at Arbor Drive where we get into pastors and, and teachers and, and everyone to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure and stature and fullness of Christ. So what is maturity? What is full-grown maturity? It's Christ-likeness. And then he says in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, so what does maturity look like? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So becoming Christ-like involves having the truth spoken to us in love so that we might grow up. And we all have a responsibility to do that for one another. Maturity is marked by love. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says this. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up unto salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. There's a desire there. There's a longing, right? Don't miss that. He says, long for the pure spiritual milk. Just don't consume it. Long for it. Desire it. Seek after it. Pursue it. Be like a baby that's hungry at its mother's breast. Just after it, right? And many people who think that they're mature just kind of lackadaisically do it out of duty. Many people that the church would look at as mature do it out of obligation. There's no longing. It's dangerous. As, as wonderful as the church is, and I love the church, 
as wonderful as the church is, it can be one of the most dangerous places for people to be if they have not experienced the genuine change of a believer who is born again, who loves and longs for Christ above everything, imperfectly, but has a desire. And when that happens, there will be love for the weaker brother. And in this text, a test or a mark of maturity is being concerned with and encouraging the weaker brother, which is revealed in not desiring to cause them to stumble in their faith. When you truly love someone, you are concerned with how you affect them. And this is connected for Paul with Christ. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor, for this is good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Paul is going to give us two examples of strength, himself and Christ. Look at verse 1. Maturity looks away from self. Maturity looks away from self. Look what he says. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. So Paul starts off by saying we who are strong. So Paul identifies with the strong person. Paul identifies with the mature person. And he says that maturity is marked by an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. So Paul is not arguing that you're under any sort of obligation of the old covenant law. He's already explained that we're free from that. But what he is saying is that you are, an obliga- you are under an obligation to love. The obligation to love does not disappear. In fact, it intensifies in Christ. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. It's a mark of a believer. It's also a mark of maturity. Paul is saying that the mature person feels and responds to their obligation to love the weaker person. The strong person, the mature person, doesn't write off the weaker person, but leans into their obligation to love that person. It's very interesting the way he words this. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, literally to carry the weak, to bear their burdens. To bear means to carry along with tenderness. It's like a mother or a father with a child. It's actually more than that. It's like a mother or father with a disabled child. Tenderly, lovingly, meets their needs, pushes the wheelchair, picks them up. Think of, think of Tiny Tim and Bob Crotchet in A Christmas Carol. Picking up his handicapped little kid and lifting him up onto his shoulder so he can see. That's what it means to bear with the weak. It's not enough to put up with them. Paul doesn't say, okay, you who are strong, just tolerate the weak. Deal with it. It, They'll either grow up or they'll leave. You you do you. He says that we're to bear their weaknesses. We're to bear the weak. To, To lift them up. Same idea of Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, it says this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Same word. Bearing one another's burdens, in other words, can also mean bearing their weakness. 
Have you ever thought about it like that? Bearing one another's burdens, we normally really think about it like they're going through a hard time. I need to come alongside them and pray for them. They're, they lost a family member. I'm going to be there for them. and that's, I'm going to bear that burden with them, right? I'm just going to help them carry that. What about when it comes to scruples over food? What about when it comes to scruples over alcohol? What about when it comes to scruples over um, language? Paul is, Paul is saying the strong person bears up the weakness of the weak. Picks that load up and helps them carry it. And the, the context here, we, we've already been through this, but the context doesn't allow for the, the weak to basically uh, form a, a terrorist cell and hold the church hostage, right? That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is there are legitimate issues with people who come from a Jewish tradition with food that they're eating. And Paul is saying, look, if you, you can eat whatever you want, just do it in faith. But if you're strong, you're going to be concerned with the scruples of the weak in this issue, and you're not going to eat that food around them because you don't want to do anything that could possibly cause them to stumble in their faith. Support them. Help them. Carry them along. Use your God-given strength in the service of God. Strength is given to the strong to be able to help others. Be sensitive to the needs of others. Notice the weak. This is so countercultural. The Roman culture did not value weakness. The, the, the Greco-Roman culture did not value weakness. The Greco-Roman culture valued strength, and you were to bolster your strength. And in many cases, that involved running over the weak. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. If you're strong, you're going to be concerned for the weak. Look at what he says, bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. He, he goes, strong people look away from themselves and toward the weak. Isn't that so interesting? Given the fact that we think that strong people look at themselves and say, well, I'm strong, I can do this. He turns it on its head. He says, no, strong people look away from themselves and look toward the weak. It totally flips all of the cultural paradigms on their heads. Selfishness, in other words, is the enemy to maturity and unity. So who are the strong? They're not identified by their knowledge or their religious activity or their conformity to a set of man-made rules or standards. The strong are those who don't focus on themselves. The strong are those who bear up the failings of the weak. The mature are those who love and bear with the weak and strengthen them, who are willing to self-sacrificially seek their good and to care for the weak, who take up their cross, in other words, and die to themselves daily. If anybody would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever seeks to keep it will lose it. And we often think about that text in terms of like coming to Christ, right? And that's true. But what about following Christ? I mean, does it just stop when we believe? We just like check that box, I'm good, let's move on. The Christianity is so, so simple. It's about little things. It's about small things. It's about seemingly insignificant things. Like dying to yourself every day. Like dying to your selfishness every day. Like looking at your brother or sister and counting them more than yourself. Let everyone not look only to their own interests, but to the interests of others in Philippians. It's small things done over and over again that reflect the beauty of Jesus. 10,000 little things make a big difference.
Love marks the strong and is shown in self-forgetting care for others. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, Paul says this. Let me back up. Verse 19, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. This is Paul talking. He says, I'm fr- I, can do, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about those scruples that other people have. I, I'm free from that. I understand the gospel. I understand how the gospel has impacted my life. I am living in the reality of what Christ has done for me. Yet, I will willingly and joyfully lay that freedom aside so that I may save some. Verse 20, to the Jew I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. That's maturity. That's grown up Christian looks like. That's what a strong Christian looks like. It's security, not insecurity. It's embracing the strength that you have, not trying to project a strength that you don't have. It's willingly laying aside things you're entitled to for the sake of others. That's what Paul's getting at here. So Paul uses himself by identifying with the strong as an example of what it looks like to be strong. In verse 2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Both the strong and the weak here. Let each of us, let everyone among us. This is now an admonition to everybody. Please his neighbor for his good to build him up. In other words, the essence of selflessness seeks the good of others. If I'm truly selfless, I'm going to seek the good of others. And selflessness is a manifestation of maturity, of strength. Let each of us please his neighbor. The word please his neighbor is to render service to or to take a pleasant attitude toward. If you go over to 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says this. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. To please someone, to please God or man, is not just action. It's attitudes. Notice what Paul's saying there. He goes, I don't do everything to get the approval of man or to please man. I do it for the approval or the pleasure of God. It's attitude. It's motive. Let each of us have this attitude to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Let's have that kind of attitude. Let's have that kind of motivation. Let's be those kind of people. Not just concerned with externally doing something in order to check a box or to look a certain way, but actually having a motive, a desire, a longing that focuses so away from ourselves and toward others that we will do things to please our neighbor for their good to build them up. It's motive. And notice what he's saying. He's not saying peace at all costs. He's saying each of us need to have this kind of attitude where we are actively pursuing the good of our neighbor. You see that? Let each, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. The goal is to help one another grow in maturity. In other words, there's no stagnant Christianity. You don't arrive. This admonition is for the strong and the weak. 
If you have that kind of attitude where it's like, well, I've been walking with Jesus for 15 years. I've killed all the big sins in my life. I, like, I've, I've got that ironed out. Yeah, sure, I, I deal with like petty little things, but those are petty little things, right? Do you notice that Paul became more and more aware of the internal, subtle, little, what we might call peccadillo sins as he grew in maturity? Like, his last letter, he's in jail, he's going to get killed. And his last letter, he calls himself the chief of sinners. I mean, this is Paul. Paul was never complacent. Paul didn't arrive. He didn't just like, okay, got that. Just get to coast now. And he lived this out. He actively pursued what was good for the church, what was good for his neighbor, to build them up. He is moving the marker away from what we do to how we love. Do you see that? Notice how open-ended this is. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. What does that look like? Whatever it takes. But if you love your neighbor, you will seek their good. You will seek to please them by building them up. Love lifts the weak on the shoulders of the strong. Love pursues the building up of others rather than the selfish ambitions of self. Love promotes the growth of others versus promoting the platform of self. We live in a world that is all about self and not about helping others. Christianity is not a competition where an individual player, it's a team sport where we're working together. You know, in baseball, there's some people that are really good at uh, fastballs, and there's some people that are really good at hitting curveballs, and there's some people that are really good at hitting sliders, there's some people that are really good at getting on base, there's some people that are really good at hitting home runs. Right, that, that, that movie, Moneyball, was all about putting people with different strengths together on the same team to be able to, to get the results that you want. Well, God does that. He puts a bunch of different players on a team that are good at different things, that have strength in this area and weakness in this area. And Paul's saying all of us need to care about one another and build one another up, not tear one another down. Oh, how we need this message in our current culture and climate. Again, we're not talking about somebody that's denying the deity of Christ or that's denying the gospel. We're talking about somebody that has a different conviction about a different thing or that is less mature in a certain area than you are or that's more mature in a certain area than you are and feels more freedom than you feel. Paul is saying, stop acting like jerks. Be for one another. Build one another up. Lift one another up. Carry one another in your weakness or in their weakness. Use your strength for kingdom purposes. The church should be the place that people feel the most empowered and the most strengthened and the most encouraged, not coddled. We're not talking about coddling weakness, right? We're moving. We're all moving. But we should all be moving in the same direction. We should all be having the same goal, the same focus, and helping one another to get there to achieve that. It's a team sport. What does it look like to build one another up? I think we can just say, like, maybe just oversimplify this maybe and just... Give three things to pray for one another, to help one another, and to encourage one another. I mean, you could put pretty much everything under that blanket. To pray for one another, to help one another, and to encourage one another. Pray for one another. You're actively finding out how you can be praying for brothers and sisters. When you see somebody in weakness, you're actively interceding on their behalf to your father to help one another. You see somebody that's struggling. You don't just be like the person in James that's like, oh, go out and be warmed when they see a cold person. No, you give them the coat. James says faith without works is dead. What good does it say if I have faith but I don't 
Live as if I have faith. And, and, and what good is it if you say, oh man, somebody's struggling. Uh, I'll pray for him. I'm in a position to help him, but no, I'm not going to do that. I don't have time. It's the same thing. We're actively looking for ways to help one another because we're on the same team. And listen, just because you might identify with the strong doesn't mean that you are not weak in other areas and that you don't need help in other areas. And there won't come a time when you're in need of help. What does Jesus say? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Help others the way you want to be helped. Think of others the way you want to be thought of. Speak toward others the way you want to be spoken to. Care for others the way you want to be cared for. And, and, and just do for one what you wish you could do for a hundred. Don't get paralyzed by the fact that the church is too big or I don't know enough people. Just start where you see a need. Start with that conversation where somebody's like, oh, man, I just had a rough week. Don't be like, oh, okay, I don't want to get into that. Eee. I thought you were just going to give the platitude. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Can we just go back to that? No, it's like, how can I pray for you? And mean it. It's helping someone up when they fall, like reaching down, giving them your hand versus criticizing and critiquing why they fell. There's a time for that, right? Your kid falls and scrapes their knee. It's, it's a... It's, it, I can be insensitive, but it's a, it's a jerk dad that's like, well, if you're running too fast, I told you not to run that fast. You know you're too clumsy to run that fast. Now, it's a, it's a loving father. It's a loving, tender dad that gets down and picks up their child and coddles them and comforts them in their sorrow, in their grief, and then maybe later on explains what happened to help them along but to care for one another, to help one another, to encourage one another. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And lest you think that this robs you of joy, happiness comes in turning away from self. How much of your sorrow and disappointment comes from seeking to please yourself? In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul's getting ready to leave. He calls the Ephesian elders together. He has a conversation with them. There's a lot in there. I'm not going to go into it. But in verse 35 of Acts chapter 20, he says, essentially, you've seen my life. You've seen how I live. You've seen how I supported myself, how I did nothing out of selfish ambition, how I spent days going house to house, admonishing people with tears. And, and you know my life. And then he quotes Jesus, and he says, as our Lord said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You will not find that in the gospel accounts. Paul, through his conversations with Peter or through hearing directly from Christ, knew of an instance where Jesus said something that wasn't recorded in the gospel. And what he said is profound. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, we apply that at Christmas time. Right? We tell that to our kids at Christmas when they're trying to itch and to open up their present or being selfish and being little jerks and are like, I want mine, I want mine. And we're the, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Do, do we actually live that out when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ? When it comes to sacrificing our rights for them? When it comes to pleasing them and building them up and doing things for their good versus doing things out of selfishness? Do we really believe that? Do we really believe it is more blessed to give than to receive? That's the fuel to be able to help somebody in need versus thinking that you're going to be happier if you just skirt around and avoid that nonsense. When we take our focus away from ourselves and put it on others, as Paul did, we enjoy blessing from that. So, one final question. Where does the desire to love like this come from? 
How do we grow in this? How do we look away from self? Because you and I are inherently wired to look towards self, not away from self. There's something incredibly supernatural that has to happen for you to stop focusing on yourself, stop focusing on your rights, stop focusing on your preference, and start to see and notice and pursue and care for other brothers and sisters who might disagree with you on secondary issues. That takes something supernatural. You're not naturally inclined toward that. Even if you're a mercy person, you're not naturally inclined toward that. Because sin has damaged you. Sin has hijacked your heart. So how do you recapture it? Paul, again, Christianity is so simple, right? We overcomplicate things. Let me give you 14 ways that you can overcome, that you can love other people better. Paul is so simple. He just says, if you're going to look away from yourself, you've got to look somewhere else, right? I mean, that's, that's just generally true. If I'm looking over here and I'm going to stop looking over here, I have to look somewhere else. So Paul goes, where should you look then? Look to Christ. Look at what he says. Verse 3, 4, because let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up because Christ did not please himself. Same word. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Paul is saying, consider Christ. Look to him, follow him. He quotes Psalm 69.9, where the psalmist laments over scorn and shame that is heaped on him for his zeal for God. And Paul is saying that Jesus perfectly embodies this. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this new life I now live, I live by faith in the one who died and gave himself up for me. Consider that, brothers and sisters. Consider that. You are dead to your old self. You have died with Christ. You have so identified with Christ in his death that you are not who you once were. You are a new creation. You have been purchased. You have been redeemed. You are not your own. So when you look away from yourself and you look to Christ and you see what he's done for you, when you see Romans 1 through 11, that leads logically. It necessitates this kind of response. Because Jesus bears the failings of his weak people on the cross. He takes your weakness and your failure and bears it up on his own shoulders on the cross. And all of the punishment, all of the wrath of a perfect holy God for all of your sin is heaped on him as he bears your weakness. It pleased the Father to crush him for you. Your failings bared up by Christ so that you might grow, so that you might know him, so that you might be reconciled to him, that you might have hope. And when you consider this and when you put that in that context, is there anything, anything that you have the freedom to do that even comes close when you give it up to what Christ gave up, to what Christ sacrificed, to what Christ willingly set aside. Look what he says. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Jesus took the reproach of people that reproach God and put it on him. And Paul's argument goes like this. You should bear up the weak if you're strong. Each of you should look away from yourselves and look toward the good of your brother. And the reason that you are able to do that, the fuel and the motivation and the power to do that comes because it was done first for you. We never outgrow the gospel. The, the sacrifice of Christ should never be so platitudinal and familiar to us that we miss and lose the weight and implications of it. 
Paul never does. His admonition for these people to act this way is rooted in what Christ has done. I'm just going to give you a few texts that you can write down and you can go look at. Christ was humble, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And by the way, that text, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, that highlights Christ's humility, starts with, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Think this way. Have this attitude. Have this motive. Christ, though he was equal with God, didn't count equality with God something to be held onto, but willingly gave it up and made himself a servant and endured the cross so that he might be exalted at the right hand of the Father. And he did that. He sacrificed himself for sinners. Have that kind of humility. Have that kind of attitude. He had a singular focus on pleasing God. Galatians 1.10. I'll just read that one real quick. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul says, look, I'm pleasing Christ. And he pleased the Father. I'm following Christ's example. Christ did nothing for himself, but only did the will of the Father in John 6, 38. Jesus sought the good of others at personal cost. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Christ was not about what he could get, but what he could give. Mark, give. Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus sought the good of others. 1 Corinthians 10, 33 to chapter 11, verse 1. Paul is not giving us a model to follow. He's giving us a motive that comes from the gospel, that comes from reflecting on Christ and what he has done for us and who he is. So Paul's argument goes like this. In light of what Christ has done for you, shouldn't you be willing to give up your rights to help your weaker brother or sister? Isn't it worth denying your selfishness to help others grow in their walk with Christ? Do you have the same attitude of Christ as Christ? Just ask that. Do you have that kind of attitude? Do you follow Jesus when it costs you something or just when it aligns with your agenda? Look away from yourself. Look to Christ and follow him. Let's pray.